Robert did you again, media, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us. My pleasure. Good to be here. Um, here we are in 2016. Did you and DD have fun? Did you ever imagine that you would still be playing thrash metal today? Oh God, no. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the question where uh, days turn into years and years into decades, you know? I mean, there was no, there, there was no plan for this. Nobody, nobody could have this foresight to see three decades down the road. Uh, I think that, you know, when you, when you look back on it, you, you see just what was the process. I said, somewhere in there, it's between dignity and honor. <laughs> it's really about, uh, you know, men doing what they like to do. Uh, with those, they like to do. Uh, and, I, you know, I think that the, you know, when the principle remains simple, uh, the results can be, um, oh, geez, uh, grand. Uh, and, and I think that that's what we have. We have something that's uh, quite special to ourselves, more of a more of a life than a career. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, and beyond me, indeed, even the other guys. I mean, this is a long-standing uh, relationship with these other dudes in the band. So, you know. Yeah, good to be here. Good to be here. Good to be kicking. Good to have a hard dick in, uh, this many years later. So it's uh, still competing with the young boys. Oh, that's, that's yeah. what's very impressed me. Yeah. That you're still competing with the young boys. So you've recorded 17 albums throughout your career. How do you pack a set list? Well, this one's very easy because we're, we're getting ready. You know, as we, we come through Glasgow, we're heading toward Germany um, down the road another week or so. We're going to be doing a DVD of uh, the Field of Fire record, our first, and the Horoscope record, our fifth. So the set list is packed with that. Uh, we have one issue that's a little bit different. We have a drummer who uh, stepped in, Eddie Garcia, here. This, um, been our sound guy for for, uh, for a ten year period, so kind of part of our fold, you know. So he knows it. He's also uh, there's a band out of Texas called Pissing Razors, which Eddie is the uh, if not the founder, the only drummer in it, and only has been. So he's a quite consummate professional. But the uh, Ron couldn't make it, so we're packing that whole thing with Field of Fire and Horoscope, which doesn't seem to be a disappointment so so far down the road. And you know, and a couple of the other uh, favorites. Uh, Sprinkled in there just for, yeah. for good well, measure. Your <laughs> I remember when I first hired Thrash Metal in the 80s, yeah. and my family told me that's just noise, there's no talent, there's no skill, there's nothing to it. Yeah, Thrash Metal is sort of the hair metal, it's sort of the, the new metal, it's sort of the grunge metal. Why do you think Thrash Metal stays so strong? Well, you, you know, I, well, people's opinions are people's opinions. You know, if it's noise and it's not music to one, it's, it's someone else's religion. And, uh, and isn't that the beauty of it? That you can, that you can, you can hit on that uh, almost spiritual level to, you know, where you become transformed. I mean, you, you know, there, there's been studies done about thrashers and, and metal people. And we, we happen to actually happen to be the most balanced people out there <laughs> because of our understanding of what commitment is. Yeah. And if you can see what that commitment is to the music, that it actually transcends generations. It's not, you know, it's not just you, but it's you, your friends, maybe your son, maybe, uh, maybe your mom. I don't know, but that does exist out there, and I think that that shows, uh, you know, a superior value. And let's say again, leading on to that, how does that make you feel when you look at your audience and you see young people, you see people in their twenties and their thirties and their well, right? Every, every now and, and then, I feel like the fucking oh. <laughs> How did that make you feel to see the young, the, the young kids in the overkill? Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of cool, you know. I mean, it, you know, the whole thing has always been a transference of energy. You know, when we were young men doing this, thrash metal was just really a voice in the dark. It, it, it was nothing more than that. There was no blueprint. There was no plan. It was kind of being created as it was happening. You know, you were kind of making it up as you went along, and and. And that's one of the purities of it, is that it was really based on feeling as opposed to overthinking it. So when you see the youth in there, uh, you know that you've reached them with some type of a principle that was founded almost three decades ago. Yeah. And it's not, obviously, it's not just my principle. There's, uh, you know, there's uh, others out there uh, quite obviously responsible uh, for this to a higher degree, uh, uh, you know, with their accomplishments. But I, but I do feel that for sure I was part of it, and you know, I, I get it when somebody else gets it, you know? I mean, all you gotta do is stand in a room, I can pick out who the real deal is in two seconds, you know, and who's yeah. a faker, you know? So, 
uh, because I've been doing it for that fucking long. So, but the uh, but having the youth in there has instilled a new, uh, let's say, a new energy that uh, you know the bands like ourselves can feed off. Whether they're musicians or whether they're just fans of the stuff, we can feed off that and compete against them. Actually, of course, Shocky from the page. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, bands like yourself, Testament, Anthrax, Exodus, all got back through the tape exchanging scene in the 80s. Would you make it today's tape exchanging scene? We're we sharing today. Yes. Yeah. Like the internet, the well, modern way of tape sharing. You know, I, I, I have to, I have two views on it. I, I mean, it is what it is, and I have to understand that. But I, you know, there's not one man does not stop progress, and, and that's as simple as it is. But I uh, particularly agree with it, and I don't. But, but you know, the other side of the coin is that I have to understand how uh, how to trade uh, physical tapes back in, the, in, in those days. You know, whether it was a COC record or you know, something came in from the UK, we, we would we would get a new tank. Uh, a, a record or album and we put it on tape or something like Tigers and Pantang, whatever it may be. Some of the punk rock we liked. So we were trading stuff back then too, just to much less of a degree because it was actually a took physical contact. And I think that one of the things is uh, that uh, we did was, you know, promotion was a lot different than, uh, you know, giving a like and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Posting. That's that's the easy thing. Just click. Oh, I wore out my fucking sneakers, you know, putting like yeah. they're putting uh, uh, flyers under under windshield wipers in, in New York and New Jersey, and that was, and that doesn't make me more special. It doesn't mean I go to school both ways uphill yeah. in the snow, but it but it does mean that I understood a different principle of, of what promotion was, and I think that when you can have uh, ease of life through a keystroke. Um, and that becomes your, to some degree, your effort, not all of it, but to some degree your effort for contribution, uh, things have less value. Uh, things just have, like you take very much for granted the fact that things are just there for you to have. Um, I, I was spawned from an age where I had to fucking earn it. You yeah. know, or I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in the mean streets of New Jersey. <laughs> take those flyers off the windshield, you make me. <laughs> That's not a keystroke, if you understand me. Right? Yeah. You can see the scars on my face. But the but the, you know the, the point is I think it's just a different understanding. And at the same time, we've also reinvented ourselves to fit within that world. I I don't think it's a fightable world. I've seen bands that fight it and complain, oh I'm getting robbed, oh this and not that. Right, oh, poor me, poor me. <laughs> you know, and, and you think to yourself, I have a great fucking opportunity here. Yeah. So you have to be a realist about the things. You can't just you can't just say piss on the internet, I just will get robbed. Then you might as well just stay home, you're not playing. That's what gets the young tech scientists are using more than technology. So there's there's two schools of thought that I have. Somewhere in between actually lies the truth. Yeah. What the school has been always been said is that the band that gave overkill the reason to it. Right? What does that album mean to you personally? Which album? Horoscope, right? Yeah. It's been said it's been like a ch the changing point in Wisconsin here. Yeah, sure. Because I you lost a major songwriter, and then you had to take over the songwriting and your partner as well. What does that album mean to you personally? Well, I mean, it was a great launching point for the second chapter in our, our history, you know? I mean, yeah, I'm not a big history guy. I mean, I, I, mean, I like reading it. I, I, you know, you forget where you came from, you don't know where you're going. You know, that's kind of the way I think about it. But, you know, the horoscope record, the pride I have in that record is the fact that it was just Didi and myself. And it was obviously a necessary change for us. Because we did, it became the point, a launching point that said we knew what we were. And it didn't matter what other people thought. It mattered what we thought. And, you know, there's nothing more dangerous than two guys from New Jersey with nothing to lose. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just the fucking way it is. <laughs> sorry about the rest of the world, but it's in our blood or in the water or something. If you want problems, corner two guys from Jersey with nothing to lose. You're gonna have problems. But the, but the point is, is that I think it gave us the opportunity to be able to push through these walls. Um, you know, it, 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 it's where you make your bones, where you, you know, you, you test the metal. That, and, that, and that's what horoscope was, and I think that it, you know, it was glorious with regard to what its results were. Because all it did was set up a whole other decade to follow it. And, and metal wasn't that popular for the late 
you know what? Yeah. Roger, and, and here's the point, you know, we came out of, we could do horoscope, we can do anything, you know, that kind of a, that was kind of the feeling. And, it, and so I think it gave us the opportunity to kind of move some mountains or, uh, or at least the strength or, or at least the belief that we could. Mm. Right. Um, for a period of time, Overkill constantly toured Europe. We were getting ignored in America, right? MTV was ignoring you and everything else. How important was Europe for Overkill to maintain what we've been doing? Yeah. Well, Europe, Europe has always been a mainstay for us. This has been one of our first, uh, this our first stops. You know, our first tour bus was in Europe. Uh, but America never ignored us. I mean, I think that's a misconception. America ignored a lot of the scene, but we toured every year twice in America for every record. So there was no total ignoring of overkill. Now, obviously, it wasn't big theaters. There were different sized clubs, but a lot of other bands just weren't touring during that particular time. So you have to look at it relative to what it was. Mm. Now, the, the impression may be that uh, we were ignored, but the reality was, is we were ignoring the West Coast because uh, the money wasn't affordable enough to go out to the West Coast. But we were sure shit weren't ignoring Texas and Chicago and New York and Florida and mm. you know the Northeast. So two thirds of the country, we were still doing a solid amount of work in and selling our most records in, Europe included. So, Europe means a lot to us, but it was always meant for us meant the spread between the two. Don't throw all your eggs in one basket. Let's pay attention to, to both sides of the pond here uh, to, to, to make it necessary to continue this on. So, how did you find the energy to, 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 to come to Europe and do all these tours? I mean, sure, it must take a toll at times. No, I, no, I mean, the last big tour we did was in the States, and that was over a month. This is only 17 days. It's a piece of cake. You know, I mean, I, I, I have a Dutch wife, you know, I mean, I like company. I come vacation. You know. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it, you know. I mean, if, I mean, for me personally, I, I like coming. You know, I like the people. I like the, I like the culture. I like, uh, I identify with the culture. I mean, you know, to some degree, there's something in, in in all of us in the states that's come from Europe. You know, unless you're unless you're an African American or, or unless you're uh, 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 a Latino. Uh, probably have some kind of European history to it. And you know, and that to me is always kind of a, it's kind of a good feeling to be able to say, hey, I kind of get some of this stuff, you know? I kind of understand this. It's good to see kind of where I came from. And I don't mean it overly prideful. I mean it just that it's a connection thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I love that kind of a vacation feeling, you know? So I, I never have a problem coming over here. It's fun. Um, went the wrong page here. Yeah. Uh, you've had a few health skills in the last few years. Um, have you slowed down a bit? Are you still blitzing on? Well, you know, I mean, obviously this has been a bit changes. My wife calls it the pacifier. I, I'm laying there in bed at night. She goes, you know, you're smoking more now than you used to. But um, I gave up the butts. Jeez. Uh, I mean, the alcohol. I mean, this is still the middle-aged boys club out here. You know, I mean, there's a couple of bottles of chilled down stuff. They're waiting to be cracked open after the show. And, but it's... You know, it's everything within moderation to some degree. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you it's totally off the hook kind of a thing, you know, a bunch of crazy old men running around with bottles of scotch. Yeah. That's not happening. But it's a good time, you know, and I like, uh, I still like having a few drinks and a few beers with the boys. You know? But as long as you understand when to do it, you know, when you can relax and when you have to do your thing, you know, then it all becomes natural. It's, it's, uh, it's just about keeping it all in balance. I understand that uh, Overkill will be in the studio next month. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about it? You know, it's, it's after 18 records, I really can't. You'd think I'd have a lot to fucking say about it, but it really is going to be an Overkill record. <laughs> is that 10 or 11 songs? <laughs> There's, uh, all right, we did uh, 11 this time. Uh, I think 10 for sure for the record. Probably going to be a bonus track, but it was written on vocal melodies that I thrown uh, at Didi. Uh, he riffed around the vocal melodies, so that's a little bit unique for us. I mean, we've only done that maybe uh, half a dozen times in our history. And they've always been kind of mainstay songs. Uh, Union We Stand was based on a, uh, a vocal track first. A song called Bastard Nation was a, a vocal track first, and so on, maybe for about six or eight tunes. But it's shoot for the release in October. Hey? Eh? But it's shoot for the release in October. 28th, I think. That's the, uh, right now is the, the Pennsylvania date for, for, the, uh, for the release. Uh, we're going to record it as we did. Uh, we have, uh, I have a studio at my 
disposal where I really like the engineer because he's not as slow as the other guys in our band, you know, and he does what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I, we did this thing. Uh, I first walked into this guy's studio. I said, Johnny, his name's Johnny Rod, right? Sounds mm -hmm. like you should be in porn, right? <laughs> so I go, Johnny, let's just get something fucking straight. Just don't fucking bullshit me. I've been doing this for too long. I don't need my fucking ass kissed, all right? And he goes to me, all right, man. And we, I do this fucking take. And I'm listening back to the take, and he goes, Wow, man, there's a lot of energy now. It's really cool. So I, I said, You didn't pay attention to a fucking word I was just saying. <laughs> I don't want my fucking ass kissed. I want to fucking put down some good tracks and get out. Is Let's get down to where our problems are. Is so he that's he right. Is he in his corner? That's all it took. Just took that one. By the second time I said it, he goes, I got it. And now we have a great relationship. And I can knock out uh, you know, an entire song a day plus, And I'll double or triple that, uh, those, um, those vocal tracks yeah. with him and never have a problem. So I work there. Dave works in Florida. Didi works in New Jersey. We'll get everybody together to, to do live, uh, the drum tracks live so everybody can play like a band. Yeah. So, you know, it's business as usual at this point. Yeah. And last question. Yeah. I spoke with Shai and Nige a once more. And they've passed on a message to you. They said, Bobby, we look forward to see you in St. Petersburg and Moscow. Yeah, we're doing a couple right. of shows with the boys over there, yeah. Look at the camera and get a message to sign Kira and Nige and tell Nige that he owes me three pints on the I think Nige, I think he just told you that you owe him three pints. Boys, we'll see you, uh, we'll see you over on the uh, in the east. Uh, we look forward to doing it again. Great band. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak yeah. to us and then we'll see you in the media. It was good. And enjoy the rest of the tour. Yeah, it was good. Who's got the Marlboros, you? Yeah?